super. Um, Professor Peter Frankopan, uh, Professor of Global History, Director of the Oxford Centre for Byzantine Research at Oxford. Thanks for making the time today. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you. Nice to see you, Ali Khan. Yes, I was thinking to myself, the last time we saw each other was at a wedding. Um, yes. Uh, it felt like a very different moment in, in time now when I look back at that moment compared to where we find ourselves today. Well, I think it's funny these things where you press pause. Yes. Time seems to be happening very slowly. It's a very good quote by Lenin. He says that, that there, are, there are decades when nothing seems to happen and then there are weeks when decades seem yes. to happen. And I think that we're in that stage now where the world seems to be revolving at a very different kind of pace to what we're all used to but in ways that are very, very unsettling because we are locked up, we're under curfew, we're prevented from traveling, and we have a kind of resemblance of normal life, but it's not quite as we know it. And I think one of the challenges is to work out what happens next. You know, do we, do we ever go back to how things used to be? And, and do we do what historians quite often do is remember the past as being much more rosy and much happier than it really was before all COVID struck? Yes. Peter, you know, I, I didn't properly introduce you because you've been a, a tremendous author of The Silk Roads, which I found such a fascinating um, uh, journey. And, and then, of course, more lately, I've been following a series of articles you've been reading. And, if, I, you know, do you think that the thesis that you're putting forward in, in The Silk Roads, which was really the reemergence of of, uh, of of that whole sort of geographical um, uh, story and narrative, do you think that's been unwound or undone in any shape or form, or do you think it's very much in play? I guess there are two two totally different things. One is what was happening before COVID. Yes. And what is the what what impact is COVID going to have on on that kind of world? I mean, I suppose at the root point, what I'm interested in is is in the history the present and the future of exchange. Mm. And when you study exchange and you learn about, or you think about resources, demographics, markets, you, you, you have to remind yourself that commercial exchange is, is one end of a spectrum of exchange, but there are all sorts of other soft things that we quite often don't pay attention to. So when people meet each other, what you're wearing, how you, what, do you, what, do you, what perfumes or scents you smell, like how do you wear your hair, what kind of shoes do you wear, all these kind of softer influences that we have. There are all sorts of of other exchanges that go on too and one of the key exchanges in history is about the exchange of pathogens and how human beings and animals and plants compete within the natural world and to that extent living through a pandemic is something which is highly predictable they come up relatively often uh, you know and in fact we, we forget there's been a lot of running back to the spanish flu of a, of a century ago but you know there were two very very serious pandemics in the 1950s and the 1960s and in fact even today about uh, somewhere between 55 and 60 percent of people who die in sub-Saharan Africa every year are killed by infectious disease. So some of it is how do we layer in this the, the common story of disease suffering problems alongside the sort of big geopolitical thing. And I, and I suppose in that sense it's quite interesting that um, where, where disease is most damaging is where there are high levels of population concentrations. And the countries that I'm interested in, the region I'm interested in, by and large from Istanbul eastwards through to the Pacific coast of China, is where about two thirds of the world's population live. So when things go right in those parts of the world, when consumers are buying, when there's investment, uh, then, there are, then, then the world ticks. When things go wrong because of disease, uh, then it's also where things you should be looking for, for um, challenges and solutions and so for example although pandemic is what we're talking about now you know climate change is not going to get affected by a bit more recycling in Nairobi or a bit more recycling in central Oxford the big challenge of climate is how do you deal with um, China and India particularly but then with Saudi Arabia Iran and fossil fuel producing nations too so to that extent the region I'm interested in makes the world tick no matter what whatever the relations are between individual countries it matters much less than the fundamentals. And so you have to separate these into two. One is what are the fundamentals about human exchange, about existence, about the way we consume, about how we spend, and then separately, how do human beings make problems for themselves? And those two have to overlay quite closely. So 
it depends exactly what the question is yeah. about is has this been derailed but i think it's i suppose in a nutshell it's fair to say that the confrontation between china and in the first instance its neighbors but above all with the united states has been something that's been bubbling for well at least a decade probably more than that but covid has for all sorts of reasons has prompted politicians policymakers business people to ask that question and as a historian it's always interesting about why they weren't answering that question before you've you've come back and i want to come back with three questions to what you yeah. said obviously the overarching uh, uh, point you were making was this sort of uh, very bipolar even uh, world where you, where we're seeing china and the us um, at loggerheads and you, you know in, my first question would be around whether you think this COVID-19 has accelerated uh, uh, that, that, that um, sort of very adversarial relationship or do you see this as a blip that will, that will ease off? My second question, which I'm going to give you all in one go, you know, I was reading back at previous episodes of uh, pathogen, uh, you know, big incidences, and there's some very interesting books. One, I can't pronounce his name, a uh, few CDs, DDs writing yeah. about that period. Another Arabic scholar, Ibn Khaldun, writing about the plague. And interestingly, it seemed as if they were very prescient in talking about the situation. And in, 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 in both cases saying, you know, this is meant to be a, a tone for you to think about because this is going to come back and attack society and the same mistakes will happen. Leaders will, will, will not be on top of the situation. So, so firstly, China and US. Secondly, it seems as if history is very circular, that, we're, that although we think ourselves so advanced, our responses in many ways have been very medieval. You know, do we wear a mask or not? And it becomes highly politicized. What do you think of that? Well, as a, as a medievalist, I, I like medieval. I mean, we, th we use the word yes. medieval to mean backwards and thick and stupid. Yes. Actually, medieval societies were quite resilient. Uh, they understood that disease was something that w had to be dealt with on a regular basis. And, and breakouts of infectious diseases above all were things that could, could and, and often did destroy communities and cities. And so I think that, 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 that I'll, I'll do them in, in the order you ask them. But, but first, so this bipolar thing about the, chi about the China and the US, it is, I think, no question that uh, the fact that the disease broke out in Wuhan and was very badly handled by the Chinese state to start with that allowed its dissemination around the world through a series of errors and uh, c catastrophic failures um, has given both parties and all in, in, the, in the States a, a stick to go after China. It's, it certainly played a role in characterizing China as a malign, um, dangerous uh, state that needs to be handled more carefully. And we've seen that in the way that the WHO has been criticized and Trump pulling out or threatening to pull out of the WHO. And in, and in terms of uh, already the big trade war that was going on before, it's, it's another layer of the way in which states are seen to challenge each other. The, the, the problem with all of this is that uh, the world is much more complicated than yes. a choice between the US and China. And when you set up geopolitics to be it's one or the other, and in fact, American policymakers and Chinese policymakers are quite comfortable doing that, it makes everybody think that we need to be picking sides or seeing things through a Washington Beijing lens. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there are lots of other actors involved. Most of these questions are quite complicated. For example, in Kenya, where you've got the railway payments that are just being due and the rescheduling of what those debts might look like. That's you know, right. there are all sorts of ways in which one could cook that up to look much more scary than it really is, but also one can underplay its significance. So the challenge is to say, is this part of a wider plan? And to what extent does it really make a difference from a with Kenyan eyes to be looking at Beijing versus Washington. From a Kenyan point of view, you want the optimal investment and the optimal investors and the optimal infrastructure at the lowest possible prices. Correct. And to that extent, it doesn't matter whether it's China or South Korea or Japan or the EU or the United States, you want as many people around the table as possible. So the bipolar problem of people talking about uh, a new Cold War and so on is it ignores the majority of the world's population who are not American or Chinese. So that oversimplification has its own 
dangers. But for sure, China is going to be one of the dominant, possibly the dominant theme of the presidential election, where we've already seen Trump and Biden try to outdo each other on who is tougher and harder on China. And equally, with China being highly aggressive in the South China Sea, the new security law in Hong Kong, uh, pressures in Xinjiang with, with concentration camps and so on, China is taking a much more robust view with, with, with other states. And, and that has its consequences as well, which will be highly um, significant in terms of other people's perceptions of China and also within China itself, the multiple voices that shape China's present and future are also being led down a, a, a particular route right now. So I think that that bipolarity have, thing is... Have you been taken aback by the Chinese response, not to, you know, uh, uh, let's avoid the US, but look, they're parked in the north of India, giving Modi a very hard time, not backing down off there, much more aggressive in the South China Sea, like you said. Hong Kong, basically, it became to look to me as if it was a put up or shut up moment and the world shut up, as far as I can see. Has that taken, uh, taken you aback or was this... Uh, I think, my, I think my, my job isn't to be surprised. My, my job is to try to understand. Yes. And to try to work out what's so, going on. Or how do you... Uh, and, and the challenge is, this, is this, are these separate issues that all look like they're part of the same behavior or are they, uh, do they need to be disaggregated? And if they are either one or the other, how are those decisions being made and what are the consequences going to be? But I'd have thought that, that the standard view would be that China has... Uh, had all sorts of incentives over the last 20 or 30 years to behave in a, in a different way. And those incentives seem to be disappearing. And that is a key part of its behavioral change, yes. right? And that's partly led, a lot of China watchers will say that's to do with, actually it's led by what's happening in Beijing by President Xi and the administration around him. Uh, uh, there's a significant role, which I think also fits into, if you are a Chinese policymaker and you see the discussions going on about, um, uh, other states intervening in your internal affairs, uh, being threatened with trade wars, being shut out of 5G contracts, what have you got to lose by being aggressive? And so the challenge is not to try and say, um, this is taking me by surprise or not, it's to try to understand what, what is happening and above all, what, what's happening next. And the problem was, as you know, much better than me, with our global supply chains, uh, with China deeply embedded in global economies, uh, we've got to we've got to think through what the consequences are whether we decouple which a lot of policymakers talk about but what that actually means not just for business which is a key part of it what does that actually mean for people in my view particularly in the bottom half of the earning capacity globally because those are the great beneficiaries of the last 30 years effectively of, of peace you know if we exclude iraq syria afghanistan a few you know problems in sudan and and in west africa by and large, these last 30 years have been very good for the global poor, particularly in the global south. So if we start to reverse all of those, what will those consequences be, not for people in China or in the United States or the EU? What above all of the consequences in South America, in North and Sub-Saharan Africa, in South Asia and Southeast Asia, and in these large population sizes, which have potential to be highly fragile? So states like in Indonesia, Philippines, Bangladesh, Pakistan, you know, just those alone, you're touching almost a billion people. And there's a massive impact on qualities of life if their refrigerators go up in value, if their food supplies become short. So I think it's trying to, trying to work out what does this mean for the world at large? And, and in that sense, the, the concern right now is that the heating up or the cooling down, which depending on which way you want to look at it, of relations between China and the US will have a primary and direct and fairly, fairly quick impact or part of the world that is already deeply stressed because of what's happening with COVID. Because by and large, poor countries which have large populations are less, resi are, are less able to support businesses and to have lockdowns in the same way that uh, richer countries have been able to do that. Peter, and, and this was what you were touching on in that article I read in Engelsberg um, Ideas, uh, and you, you said the crisis is the capacity to turn apocalyptic. And I think th these were the points you were making. And it was quite, uh, um, uh, it was quite stark what, what, you know, what, what the picture you drew there, and particularly in the context of Africa as well. Um, uh, and and uh, so just, if you can just explain what you were saying, you were saying that COVID, this sort of US-China dispute, a global slowdown in trade, and I can't remember the number, you had a huge number for the amount of people who are going to recede back into poverty. 
So, you know, do you see that as, as a possibility, what you outlined in that article? Well, so the, 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 the headlines there come from the International Labour Organization yeah. that say that, that already 50% of the world's working population are either without a wage or at risk of losing their jobs. That's incredible. And, and that, it's, it's, it, well, it's incredible. We know it's incredible, but you know, yeah. we see what the unemployment figures are right now in the US. And when you add in not just the headline unemployment, but there are a lot of students, there are a lot of retirees, there are a lot of veterans, there are a lot of people with disabilities, there are a lot of people who are homemakers. When you add that all up, even in the United States, we're looking at, at somewhere like 40% or more of the working population not drawing a paycheck in the richest economy in the world. So um, you can then look at it in two different ways, I think, in, in countries that don't have the kind of government ability to support businesses in the way that has happened in, in Europe, for example. And that is either if you are in a country where the government either performs poorly through corruption measures or doesn't have a big enough budget to be able to support infrastructure, then the expectations of the population are already so low that people are used to having to be resilient and used to surviving. Yes. And in that sense, they're quite well adapted to being able to cope with very difficult situations. On the other hand, and, and from, the, from the World Food Programme, the FAO, their estimation was that by the end of this year, we might be seeing 300,000 deaths by starvation every single day because of not, not enough manpower in fields, collapsed agricultural supplies. That's uh, and That's it, well, it's, it's, it's genuinely apocalyptic. Yes. And the, I mean, the, but you know, numbers, as you know, in projections, uh, whether it's in business or in development funds, are, are often highly speculative. And sometimes you make aggressively negative speculations to, to try to scare people into action. But I mean, I think it's no surprise, for example, that the Chinese stockpiling of grains, of wheat, of soybeans over the last four months in anticipation of a second wave has been very much in preparation for the fact that there will be short, the expectation that there yeah. may be shortages. But funny enough, yeah, they've been buying from the Americans. Uh, they haven't been stockpiling from the Americans. If you look at the data. Well, of that, that is exactly right. And, and in fact, you know, China's been leveraging its position to be able to scoot globally, not just the PPE and the medical kit that it was doing in January, but, but from Brazil, from South, from South Africa and so on. So one of the questions will be, how do supply chains function in a world where people can't get out to work? And I think one of the surprises and one of the reasons to feel a bit more optimistic, Ali Khan, is that right now supply chains have been relatively robust. Yes, you know, food is still on the, on, the shel the, on the shelves in supermarkets. There were initial worries about toilet paper. Those, were, those didn't come to anything. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm going to guess that was somebody very inspired at one of the big toilet paper companies who put that out. I saw the sales of B-Days all over the world. And the it was extraordinary, wasn't it? It was like it was the toilet paper squeeze. <laughs> And of course, that's a real cultural difference too. You know, so I had lots of lots of commentators in the Middle East saying, "You see, this is why the hose and the and the water pipe is, is much, much better, better. Yes. and much safer." Well, and you see, so I think the, the the pandemic it throws up all of these strange cultural differences between us about how how do we cope and how how do we how do we provide resilience, but factoring in pandemic pressure on supply chains, potential food shortages, climate change. You know, we suddenly think and remember that the world. Is, uh, is very fragile. Mm. And if we'd been doing this a year ago, we'd have been talking about earnings, we'd been talking yes. about you know, the trade war and who's gonna win. We'd be talking about, will there be you know, reshoring of jobs to the US? We'd talk about Vietnam and Southeast Asia and taking market share away from whatever. Right now we think you know, we're, we're one minor eruption, we're one minor contact of a, between the military. Uh, you know, this morning Turkey's tested out its new cruise missile. I didn't see that. So, you know, we, one thing can go wrong and suddenly we're on the, the ice cracks. And right now, globally, whichever state you're in, it's as thin as it could possibly be. You know, yeah. today here in the UK, we're opening up, opening up pubs. We're still not allowed to play cricket. Are you, going that for right? Are you going for It's only open. I, I'm talking to you instead, my <laughs> local pub. Oh, thank you. That's I, will go in, I will go in. But, you know, I think we suddenly think that this world that, that you and I have lived in, all in our views for the last 20 or 30 years, where there've been disagreements, there've been challenges, there've been different opinions, lots of, lots of, of very important discussions about Belt and Road, about US 
and its engagement in other parts of the world, not, not least Africa, but also in the Middle East and so on. Russia and its involvement uh, in, in the Caucasus, in the Middle East, likewise, in Crimea and Ukraine. And, you know, but we felt we, we, we could afford to not really pay them an enormous amount of attention. Yes. Suddenly right now, we realize that one of the problems about being globalized is that we're all, we're all doomed together if it all goes wrong. And so one of the challenges is how do you make sensible decisions around defense, around digital, around climate, around governance, around financial systems where Western societies are printing money in a way that would never be allowed to happen in the developing world. They couldn't do it. It would right, and, and, and in due course, those kinds of inequalities become um, political tools too, you know, and China's been quite astute, I think, at reminding states that uh, the bailouts for big banks in the US in 2008, this was a Western Anglo-Saxon mm -hmm. problem that went through London, New York, by and large Middle East, Islamic finance wasn't so badly affected, et cetera, et cetera. And to that extent, you couldn't wish for a better president right now in the White House from a Chinese perspective than, than Trump. Yeah. Even though, as it happens, Trump is not wrong, in my opinion, to be trying to reset some of those trade relationships with China. These issues around, inter uh, around intellectual protection, around balancing of trade, around access to each other's markets seem to me not only sensible, they seem to be entirely logical. But because he does them in the way that he does, and because we're so used to playing the man yes. and not the ball, Yes. We are so we are so attracted. We're so drawn to the sort of car crash of his every single press conference he gives that we don't look at the substance. So we're part of this problem too. We've got to be thinking always about the substance rather than the style, and about what is it? What is the world going to look like that we live in? And those Chinese values, as you know, in, in Kenya, they're not for free. You know, there are choices that one makes about surveillance, about access to digital, about trading relationships, about access that are difficult ones mm -hmm. and you know one has to think them through carefully but I think it, it's probably the time uh, is coming that, that states try to work together rather than try and solve these big questions on their own and, and, and lack of governance has been the big theme of 2020 lack of international leadership and lack of interna international governance around COVID has been the biggest challenge so in a funny way where I feel less apocalyptic is that you know climate requires global coordinated action uh, financial regulation requires global coordinated action. So we don't just have leaders who park their cash in Switzerland or the Cayman Islands with no consequences. Pandemics require that too. And, and we'll see that again in our, in our lifetime, if not our children's. And so it could be that that, that, that is one of, the, one of the silver linings that comes out of this is a better way of states finding a way to work together. But as you can see in Europe, we're not very good at that. Otherwise, Brexit wouldn't have happened. And even trying to work out which countries we can visit from the UK shows that we're, it's, you know, we're, we're much better at getting things wrong than getting things right. What explains the success of countries like Vietnam, for example, Taiwan, New Zealand, at dealing with this uh, pandemic, and then the failures of some other countries, the United States, for example, where we're hitting record highs in Brazil. Uh, it, is there a theme that you see that, uh, that that, that tells you where people are going to be successful or where people are going to fail in dealing with this? Uh, I guess there are three, three explanations and, and one has to work out which weight one puts to all of them. First, the countries that have been most successful by and large have been geographically peripheral. Is that right? right? So, okay. Well, so they, they tend to be coastal, they tend to be, you know, the, the Baltics, the, the Greece, places that are significant and plugged in, but they're not primary. Whereas, of course, the, the bigger the city, the bigger the connections, the bigger the air routes, the more networked you are in. That's number one. Uh, number two, I think in, in the case of, of, uh, of East Asia and Southeast Asia, there is an understanding that um, pandemic is, is an ongoing problem and that there's been an early warning system since, since long before the SARS outbreak in 2002 and 2003. So an awareness of how to live and how to react when it happens. Whereas we were incredibly slow and the United States still um, not just slow, I mean, looks negligent in the fact that it's not taking this stuff seriously. So I think that's been part of it too. The third one, I suppose, is that you, a big sweeping statement, rich countries think that they're immune. You know, they think that they can get away with it. They think that, they think that their health, health systems will save them. And they think that, that you, know, you can take, take a chance because when you've always got food on your table, 
when you can go on holidays, when you can travel from New York to LA, when all the films that you see are hoisting the American flag, or in Britain, we have the imperial disease too, where we, we think we deserve a bigger role in global affairs. Uh, you know, I think that you can, you can fall back very comfortably on your history of who you think the state, what the state is and what the past is, and that, that you triumph. And if you triumphed over the Germans in the Second World War, you'll probably triumph over COVID. And that can give you complacency. And states like Vietnam, New Zealand, South Korea, you know, have had experiences very different to the triumphant story of Europe in the Second World War. I think it's, it's perhaps no coincidence, but that's much more hard to, to evaluate, measure, prove, and so on. But I think that the, the honest answer is, if you lock down quickly, you cut the number of deaths. And, you know, the United States still isn't fully locked down. So we're seeing those numbers going through the roof. Let me finish off, because I'm aware you've got a pint waiting for you. Yeah. You know, you described it like a portal, that we're, we're on the cusp of this portal and we don't know what's going to be there in the, in the future. What, how do you, you describe that you think it's going to be uh, more multi, needs to be more multilateral and we're going to have to cooperate a bit better than we've been doing all of these countries, but what else would you say? I mean, do you think it's going anywhere back to where it was, uh, given all this money we've printed, can we afford, you know, can our governments afford, is it endless money printing that can go on? Or, and how do you think, uh, you know, economies will look like? Are they going to have to change and reshape themselves? I think it's exactly the question you could ask a historian at any point, going back 20,000 years to the first time people drew on cave walls. You know, what is tomorrow going to look like? Can we cope? Will we survive this harsh winter? How do we rebuild after the war? And, you know, the bottom line is that human beings are capable of profound um, uh, hurt to each other. You know, that we're capable of killing each other on a, on a scale that actually could bring about the end of the planet. But we are also highly resilient. You know, we're able to rebuild and regroup. You know, we are able to put our differences behind us and we're able to write symphonies and create works of art and find ways to help the poor and to provide education and to, to look for social mobility. So I wouldn't underestimate our capacity to reinvent the wheel because that's what, that's the reason why we're here today in the world after all. All of our communal ancestors have found ways to survive against nature as well as against each other and against problems about inflation. And, and um, you know, I remember that the first, first time I, I ever saw a banker Yes. Um, who was a friend of mine, he told me that he nearly got fired because the market had gone down and he had an angry client. And he'd said to his client, who is incredibly wealthy, he said, well, it's only money. Yes. And the guy exploded and said, well, it's not only, but, you know, the truth is your, you know, our standards of living may, may drop, but they will then hopefully come back up again. You know, this is better to be dealing with uh, how do we restart and re-kick economies into, into action than dealing with what happened in Rwanda, for example, or former Yugoslavia or in the Middle East, you know, where there's been warfare and people murdered and communities have turned on each other. I think in this case, how do we stop ourselves going off a cliff? How do we get food security for particularly the, the, the poor and particularly in the global south, in my view? If we can get through all of that, then, you know, if, if some of the goods cost more or cost less, you know, I don't think that's the worst problem to be dealing with historically. The stuff that scares me is about mutation of disease Yes. Uh, this COVID has been economically very damaging, but from a mortality rate, thankfully, yeah. because we've got That's amazing doctors and hospitals, it hasn't been too bad. And I can promise you that yeah. normally pandemics kill on a much, much higher level. That's and true. it's very likely that, the, that this is a dress rehearsal for something much more serious. So I've written something also about I biosecurity yes. and about how, how laboratories have leaked. In the UK, uh, on average, every three weeks, there's a it's failure of security. Scary when you look at it that way. Yeah, and, and you know, that, that uh, all of our, our armed forces around the world are trying to work out how to have biological programs to help them resist what comes towards them. But there's strong incentives right now to be digitally sub subversive, uh, subversive to, do, to be able to attack people where you don't have to roll your tanks up to their border, but you can undermine their energy grid remotely, yes. where, you can, where you can use these networks and connections we have in malign ways. Um, you know, there are, there are real concerns, I think, around the biological program. So at the end of last year in the Vostok facility in Russia, it's one of only two places in the world. Oh, 
that, that stalls the smallpox um, pathogen. There was an explosion in one of the rooms that set part of the building on fire. Yeah. And you know, an escape like that um, sets us back into something much, much worse potentially than, than COVID. So I think we should be grateful for every day that passes, that we wake up where, you know, the, the world is still arguing on Twitter rather than anything more serious than that. So, you know, I think that we'll, we'll, we'll be okay, but we may have a, a period of, uh, of long-term degraded living conditions. But as, the, the thing to worry before the end of this year is that, that starvation figure of 300,000 per day That's that the lot. FAO are warning about. When you put that in the context of 5,000 max a day dying from COVID, 300,000, that's uh, horrendous. Peter, it's been a pleasure speaking with you and thank you for giving us uh, your perspective and thank you for making the time as well. Always a joy. Stay safe. You too. And give my love to the family. Will do. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Good. Thanks a lot. Is that okay? Perfect. Good stuff. <laughs> thank you. See you soon. I'm going to run to the pub. Okay, enjoy it. <laughs> And, and let me know if I can ever help Ali Khan. I, I want to do an event with you one day in conversation yeah, yeah. to hear, I, your, to hear I, your view. I, I, I want to do it with you. This was a practice run. There we go. Take right. care. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.